Okay. Hey, everybody. Today is February 21st, and this is the KCP community meeting. Uh, I've got the current item uh, or agenda issue up in the screen share. Let me paste the link if you need it. Uh, if you don't have an item on the agenda and you'd like to add one, please feel free to add a comment. Uh, and we also are doing our best to use uh, raise hands in Google Meet. So if you do have something that you'd like to say, please hit the raise hand button and I will moderate and we'll go from there. So Steve K, you have the first few topics. Over to you. Thanks. Oh boy. Um, cool, I don't know to what extent we wanna like uh, hash out all these in the meeting or just bring attention to it and then maybe talk more asynchronously. Um, and Andy, I'm glad you're here since I wanted your, your input on this one. So the first one, uh, we generally have just one place where we're doing uh, API requests across uh, resource identities. Um, and it's in these partial metadata, you know, star cluster requests that feed these generic inform or generic controllers. And I'm wondering. I'm sorry. Can I just ask what ahead. meant by cross identity? Uh, sure. So, uh, Mike, are you, are you familiar with the um, API resource? Uh, sorry, the API export identity hash. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the, the thought there is basically uh, there's uh, if if two separate providers wanted to both have a. Uh, the same group version resource that they provided. Um, ultimately, we want their view of people that are bound to them to be scoped only to the ones that are bound to actually their particular export. Sure, um, makes sense. So we assign each export an identity, um, and then in storage we actually hash out which. Sorry, that's a not literal hashing, but we you know we separate out the different identities so that you can look at um, individual ones and. <clears throat> um, Andy had spent a bunch of time, I guess, two weeks ago, hunting down bugs that ultimately came down to the fact that it's very tricky to correctly handle the case when you're trying to make requests against multiple different identities that have you know, potentially different schema, different types of versions available. And I'm wondering if we want to reconsider that approach. Yeah, who would want to do that? I mean, I would think. If I'm trying to bind, I would bind to one of the exports, not all of them. Right. So it's yeah, only Mike, highly just, privileged system. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, just a reminder, Mike, please use the raise hand feature if you wouldn't mind. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, thanks. Uh, Steve, you feel free to answer, and then Stefan will go over to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, the only uh, the only current users of this are like super highly privileged system controllers that are trying to do actions on quote unquote generic objects, and they really don't care about anything except for uh, the metadata in the first place. Um, so they're able to kind of sidestep the problem that the rest of the schema might be totally different. Um, and obviously, in cube, the partial metadata requests don't have the same properties because you're guaranteed to have the same schema elsewhere. Um, Stefan? Yeah, so they are used by garbage collection, namespace controller, I guess. And especially the resource uh, label controller of workloads, right? TMC. Yeah. So yeah. they are, and maybe Kota as well. I don't know. Um, they are very generic controllers, and it's highly privileged. All of those at the moment would, they would work, or they work at the moment with a loopback client, right? So I think I agree, Steve, with you that. This is not a pattern we want to um, encourage to use. So we, we could restrict that, like just Kubeck can use it basically. So somebody who forks KCP can make use of it, but externally it's not usable. Even as a system master, it's not usable. Something like that. that. precludes us from ever splitting um, the control. No, no, um, the at the moment, we have, I mean, we have those controllers, and fixing or changing them is, is not easy, right? But I agree with what you're basically saying. Um, it might be a pattern we don't want long term, so let's somehow restrict it. That's all. Andy? Yeah, it it only it, it exists for the few 
use cases that Stefan mentioned, it originally came about because when we, like even before we had API exports uh, and API bindings, we had the um, resource scheduling. And if you had deployments, for example, that were imported as a CRD into different workspaces, and they came from different Kubernetes versions, so in different OpenShift Kubernetes clusters at, at different times, we originally had code that said every single CRD, every single deployment CRD had to have a compatible open API schema. And if we couldn't identify that they were compatible, the system basically threw its hands up in the air and said, you can't look at these CRDs. And so we implemented logic that said, mainly for resource scheduling, but it does have other uses, uh, we don't care about the spec, we don't care about the status, we only care about the metadata, and basically we only care about the labels. And that is common across all types uh, and common across all versions, and it doesn't matter about the identity. So that, that's why it was created. Um, I would be really curious to try and do some brainstorming to see if there's ways to maintain efficiencies because this is an efficiency um, versus having to do something else or um, you know would we have to say that the uh, the resource scheduling is identity specific and you need to feed it multiple identities so I, I think it's worth doing some brainstorming as a like separate exercise. Uh, Stefan, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick addition. Um, the resource scheduling controller of workloads. Um, I think we our philosophy has changed that exports are explicit. So it's not that every sync target will get, get its own APIs. So there are not so many. So we could change that back to identity-based watching. I think that's fine. Yeah, so that, that and I would that actually issue. prefer. I, don't I think, would, yeah, I would, I would prefer to actually only watch those which are used in syncing. I think it's everything at the moment. If I'm not wrong. Yeah, um, still doesn't really help with quota or garbage collection, but we can figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, Steve. Uh, you are muted. I think I saw two like classes of usage. The first one was quota and garbage collection. And the second one was um, like the scheduling bits where it seemed like, because uh, I know, I think either David or, or Jim put in the PR that dynamically starts and stops syncer controllers against individual sync target virtual workspaces, right? And I feel like we could do a very similar approach with the scheduling bits. And that would also deprivilege them, right? And so I feel like for the garbage collection and quota bits, you know, very concretely, we're talking about an efficiency gain of when there are many identities for the same GDR, right? I think, I mean, telemetry might help us in the future for that sort of thing, and we might reconsider it. But I wonder if we've jumped the gun on that efficiency and potentially opened us up to this entire class of bug that you spent two weeks fixing that otherwise doesn't exist in the system. And the only reason I really brought this up today was, you know, while we were fixing those bugs, I didn't hear a conversation about, oh, hold on, is this actually like that valuable that we want to spend this much time on it? Um, and I just wanted to give some time to that. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I also, uh, so when, looking into those flakes and bugs, I think one of the um, one of the side effects before fixing the bug was that the work queues for quota and garbage collection essentially and effectively got, but not backlogged, they basically just got stuck. And so um, you could see in the, Prometheus metrics that we gathered at the end of the test run, when we had quota failures or garbage collector 
collection failures and the EDEs, those work queues were in the 200s and they were just sitting there. And so before I had identified the root cause of the bug, I was thinking, well, maybe we just go in and fix quota or hack quota and GC upstream so that we don't have to spin up an instance per workspace like we're doing right now. But that doesn't solve the problem necessarily because if we do make that change, we need to be able to see, uh, I think we need to be able to see things across. But, but I think it's, it's worth exploring ways to deprivilege that and um, see if we can you know, fix that. Okay, I'll try to sum. Or sorry, David. Uh, yes, just about the scheduling part, you know, the TMC part. I think we we still need to keep in mind uh, the quite important separation between scheduling and and syncing. Uh, that's right. That the syncing, you know, uh, goes through the various APIs that are exposed by this virtual syncer, but it's it's through APIs. It's not really through identities because the filter filtering is already done um, at, at the virtual workspace. Uh, level, but then uh, we also have to think about, you know, some some future uh, opportunities of defining customizable scheduling, and so we we should still be careful about keeping things simple and really separate those two those two layers. The the scheduling is something which is um, really API agnostic which is which is applied on any type of object according to uh, how it has been uh, uh, placed so uh, really we have to define and separate those i think just wanted to to mention yeah. that yeah. Uh, steve yeah i mean I, I think that makes sense david what what i was saying as well is like even though it's scheduling is uh, mm -hmm. resource agnostic you can only schedule things that are resources in the supported workload export in the first place. And so if you look through the virtual workspace for that workload export, you can see everything that could potentially be scheduled. And so like a dynamic literal discovery might be helpful there, like something in that vein um, mm -hmm. means it's still agnostic, but it's not like you, you have some idea of what you're looking at, not literally anything in the yeah, system. Steve, maybe explore. let's file either an issue or a discussion. Yeah, a discussion. And do I'll some brainstorming. Yeah. Cool. cool. Thanks. Uh, so you have the second item. Yeah. Uh, um, these next two can kind of go together. I, I mostly just wanted to ask. I feel like I've seen a lot of conversations from, from different folks about it, it seems very um, like hesitant or uh, conservative, I guess, is how I might put it, in how we're changing our APIs. And you know, one example of this is this placement spec location resource, which you know it has some background, but it's confused multiple people now. And then another one I saw was uh, unschedulable shards. The decision was made to add a pseudo API through an annotation, and I, I just wanted to kind of hear people's thoughts on like what we're gaining as a project by being this conservative about our v1 alpha 1 APIs and maybe are we contorting ourselves a little too much here if there's a field that nobody uses but might be used in the future like let's delete it until it has a use um, and then we don't risk confusing folks in the community that are looking at it for the first time Stefan they have opinions about both topics obviously um, Maybe the easiest one, location resource. I don't think it's a good idea to remove it because it. So there's a core design decision or a guideline of, of those two APIs, locations and placements. Namely, it's, it's not works workload specific. As long as they live in scheduling K uh, K uh, KCPIO, I think location resource is a must. Because otherwise, we bind the API something which um, it, it's it's not meant for just workloads. And uh, I think there are use cases where you can use some or want to use something else. Um, about the other topic, I kind of agree that we should be more flexible in the alpha APIs. 
But in any of every of those cases, I would like to see an exploration where we want to go. Don't add one of fields because it's easy. And this was one of those fields. Um, we had we had a much more complex um, uh, Sharp API at some point, and it had plenty of fields which were imp uh, not implemented or half implemented. And we had to throw all of them away. This is not better than being conservative. This this very case here about uh, unschedulable, maybe that's easy enough, so Boolean doesn't hurt. But I, I think it's a good uh, good process. If you want to add something, at least describe in a sketch document the next two steps where this should go as an API. And we haven't done that here. That's why I think an annotation is totally fine. If somebody wants to invest in that and investigate uh, how a, uh, a spec of a, of a chart should look like, sure, go for it. And then we can start first steps to add something. That's my opinion. Back to you, Steve. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense um, for the second part. For the location resource, uh, if I remember correctly, this field tells you what type the placement, or sorry, what type the location is closing over. So if I create a placement, this will say sync target. Yes. And yes. like that seems fundamentally at odds with the idea that a placement consumes a location, the location closes over whatever else is happening. Like the location is a abstraction given by the uh, compute provider. I consume that. I don't know what ha happens under the covers. Why do I need to know that a yeah, target is what's happening there? Th th there's one problem, and I think we talked about that before. When this was made, this AI, um, this location workspace separation, we didn't have, right? Now we have a placement that doesn't talk at all about SIM targets. Yeah. But somehow we have to identify the right locations because there might be more than that. There might be locations for. But don't we already have a label selector? Like, isn't the isn't that's the true. meaning that's of that selector that you no, choose no, no, was semantically meaningful to completely you? Completely different. So imagine no. um, a, a different um, workload API, be it Edge or be it I don't know um, some other like you schedule Kafka's for example, and it's not a sync target, it's not TMC, right? You sync, you also sync somehow, but it's a different kind of workload syncing. And you have your own syncer, and it installs Kafka into your clusters, for example. And then you want to, um, I mean, there must be also something like a sync target, but it's it's not the workload one, it's not TMC. But you're saying that the, the label selector, so like I'm a user, I create a placement, and in that placement, yeah. I, I provide my, semantically meaningful intent of where I want to be placed. And you're saying there's a case where that set of labels also perfectly matches a set of locations that aren't the right type. Which are independent, yeah, which are about. I feel like there's maybe APIs. a modeling issue here then. Yeah, yeah, and I agree about that. We have to talk about that. I, I'm just okay. saying it's too easy to, to just remove that. We need some more thoughts. OK. I'm okay with with more thought, but um, yeah, on the face of it, a field that only exists because of maybe potential theoretical might be use cases seems kind of weird, especially when it causes new users to have questions basically every time they look at it. Go ahead, Mike. And the background is obviously this is an API not only for TMC. Um, whether it's sensible to to make this uh, to have this goal. Um, we can talk about that, of course. But if we change that, we have to move the API. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Qu question and comment. Yeah. For Edge MC, we're defining our own uh, Edge placement type, um, so uh, we're not exactly, you know, um, I mean, it's, it's different from TMC, so we have our own placement. Um, and also, um, I'm you know trying to follow this stuff without. Um, I'm having good clues here, um, but it's just looking at what happens when I run through the quick start and the behavior that I see now is that um, it creates a TMC placement object that uh, refers to sync targets rather than locations. So it, I had drawn the conclusion that locations were being phased out. Um, by the way, in Edge MC, 
Um, I, you know, so far I've been taking the um, maybe just lazy or opportunistic approach of we do need two abstractions, one of which very naturally would be called location. Um, and it is like a geographic location, uh, right? Think of just you know, in the edge world, right? There, there, there's a natural concept of location. Um, and it might have multiple clusters in it. So uh, it's a very natural modeling to say a location corresponds to a physical edge location and a sync target corresponds to a cluster in an edge location. So that's the approach we've been taking. Um, and I'm not quite clear what's going on in TMC. So that's why I'm asking about where the locations are being phased out. And if I understand correctly, what you're talking about is in the TMC placement, there is this field that says what type of thing are is the predicate over the label predicate over uh you know and it was originally locations now it seems to be sync targets and i'm trying to understand here stefan yeah so um there's no change in in sync target or location what you what you target you target locations but um as i explained before there is a selection process which locations you mean um but i very much like what you bring up here so you have a placement as well i think when we when we created that api we didn't even have api bindings and you might remember that was very early probably when we had this idea so nowadays we can basically bind in the edge placement and we could bind in the tmc placement right depending on use case which is a good data point that maybe it makes sense to move it to workload and then get rid of location resource as well. And I could imagine there are other cases where you need a slightly different placement as well. We don't have many data points here, but it's a good feeling. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, and uh, I'm also happy to um, take this offline, but Mike, I'd love to hear what, um, like how did you guys choose to do your own placement? Were you fundamentally looking at a different API surface? Yeah. Um, we, um, so first off, we, you know, when we first discussed it with this community, uh, I think there was a suggestion, and it made sense to me that we should have our own placement because we got our own semantics. Mm -hmm. um, the first and foremost difference is that in TMC, there is a selector, and the semantic is, uh, any cast or choose one. Um, in Edge, we want choose all or multicast, multicast rather than any cast. Okay, um, so it seems natural since it's it's distinct semantics to have a distinct type to make the modeling clear. Um, yeah. Also, um, I not I'm having trouble understanding what Stefan is saying about uh, locations are still being used. When I follow the quick start, it creates a placement that refers to sync targets not locations yeah this, this, mike this is a confusion or this is a problem that, that steve points out here that it's a this is q in the in the levels of abstraction here like the user has to, to know about sync targets in the placement but he never sees sync targets so um that's a modeling problem we have Does and the, this would um, go away this would go away when we remove location resource and move the api yeah, Mike, the, the field there is saying, uh, here's my label selector. Please any cast me to any location that matches my label selector as long as the underlying thing underneath that location is a sync target. Um, and I think in the world that you're referring to, and, and the reasons that you had for making your own placement are perfect. I think that's you know, perfectly reasonable. In that case, we might want to reconsider whether this indirection makes sense at this level. Oh, so maybe I misunderstood what's going on now. So if I run through the quick start now and I get a placement that has a field selector and it has a location resource, and it says the location resource is sync target, the field selector is still a field selector over location objects. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's complicated. Is, by the way, is it written down anywhere? I think Google does live transcripts of uh, G meets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think, I think I'll take an action item to also put a, another discussion maybe yeah. on KCP for this one.
Thanks. Thank you, Steve. All right. Um, I think let's move on to Lionel's topic on API life cycle, life cycle hooks progress. Yeah, I just want to share like quick progress on this. Um, first one is I renamed this proposal from workspace initialization to something more like API life cycle hooks. I think it's capture a bit more what the work is about. Uh, and then um, I, I didn't do much on the uh, on on the proposal here. Uh, I just added like two CRDs, uh, one uh, PI's lifecycle export, which is where you can define the hooks, and then the uh, and equivalent, and the, the other one, which is the API lifecycle binding, where you capture the uh, the, the accepted uh, claims. So I spent some time actually understanding permission claims. So uh, that's why I didn't make uh, much progress on this. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Uh, everyone for helping me with this. Um, so the next, uh, so we don't have to discuss the uh, the proposal here. I guess we can take this uh, offline. Uh, but I started to work on a kind of, uh, uh, of uh, I'm, I'm working on the on the POC. Uh, and maybe the question I have for Stefan, because he, he said always uh, not to have this in core. And what do you mean by that? All right. Yeah, this is a, a rule of some imagine you cannot change kcp like package uh, the pkg in the kcp repo is forbidden you cannot go there you cannot change anything um can we build this thing what you want to build so it's it's more like a guideline to to think about um, how to build the thing do we have everything to enable that if not maybe you have to add something to claims for example to our virtual workspaces and only as a last step when we think, OK, this is so complicated outside, then maybe we can consider to do it in, in the main ACP. Um, but I think we are not there. The hope is that we can do it outside. Yeah, I think we can do it outside. I, uh, I need to uh, to check that. Uh, yeah, I mean, and which, to be very clear. And we could still have this um, as a binary in KCP, if it makes sense maintenance-wise. But it wouldn't be in the main KCP binary, like you have to start it next to it or something like that. Mm -hmm. There are many ways to do that, but this is more like a maintenance question. Um, for the design, it's really this rule of thumb. Let's try to be outside and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. So concretely, you would like to see this more like in a separate repo or in a, in a KCP repo? Where is That's the... a maintenance question. I don't care so much, or not so much about that. I mean. It's more important to have the architecture right. That it's on the right level of KCP when you have uh, imagine levels of APIs there, and that must fit. That's more important. Okay. All right, great. Thanks. I think we maybe want or should write down some guidelines for what types of functionality live in core versus not because right now I don't think we have any of those guidelines and it, it could be helpful. Yeah, there's one guideline should be minimal, which means right. you, you must have good arguments to uh, increase the size and scope. You can write it down, of course. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think when we have KCP minus core as a binary, I think we will be there that we can have a small go and go yep. uh, doc md or something dot go file there and describe that sounds good um so uh thank you for the update lionel it like, sounds like you're working on a proof concept is that right yeah yeah that's correct okay uh well if you need any more help you know where to find us and uh if anybody's interested in helping them out please get in touch all right, um, Sergius, um, do you want me to run through this? Uh, yeah, I have something prepared actually, so I can I can go through it as well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so let me turn a couple of things to show. Um, Windows. So it is something I've been working on in the last days to improve our ability to actually debug in the food <laughs> what we produce here. So. 
I guess we are like more or less still flying a little bit blind, like when it comes to our promise, like we are supposed to do things fast and very efficient when it comes to creating workspaces. And uh, I just want to, yeah, everybody that is working on um, pull requests, just make aware that you now have the possibility to actually prove that you improve things uh, based on metrics. What that actually means, like if we take any, any arbitrary pull requests, um, Let's take this one from David. We are storing all the um, Prometheus metrics that we are scraping from um, KCP end-to-end -end test runs, um, which you can then download or inspect uh, online. And um, for specifically for, for GitHub builds, you can just go into details and then on the summary. And then you have this tarball here called E2E. Let's take for the sharded one, for the E2E sharded one, sharded metrics, you can just simply download it. Um, and yeah, unzip it locally. Um, and as you see, this is a little bit of a convoluted process, but still works. At least that's the only way I know of how to do it for GitHub. And then you have uh, this little uh, command that you can execute if you have Prometheus installed locally. Um, and then you can launch and inspect your metrics uh, for the E2E run. And this is, you know, sort of like, um, the collected metrics that happened during the E2E run on, on GitHub Actions. Um, that's a little bit convoluted. I will show you in a second, like a way easier way on how to inspect those metrics instead of downloading them locally, but just from a structure, uh, beware that we have many E2E tests that start a small KCP server locally. And for those um, tests where we started a um, KCP uh, locally, you have the label test equals and then the name of the test uh, that one gives you like sort of like the details <coughs> on, on the collected metrics there. Um, when we have long running tests like the shorted test, like we don't have the test label um, because like it's a whole um, E2E test fixture setup that is being spawned, but they we have different components being spinned up, like different shards, KCP0, KCP1, as you see here, KCP front proxy. And you can nicely see exactly the same metrics sort of like laying side by side. And, and here you also see sort of like how KCP1 is getting less requests than KCP0. Um, so just for, for the structure of the, of the metrics. I hope this will help debugging a little bit, um, especially when we're working things on like caching and distributing things, uh, distributing requests. This will give us sort of like a better overview um, on how KCP behaves, behaves during runtime. Um, since this is very convoluted, what I just showed you, it still works for GitHub. We have a much better way for doing it um, for end-to-end -end test results uh, that were um, tested by Prow. So, and then here you see those uh, Prow jobs. And let's say you want to inspect, well, let's take the same job, the sharded job. Um, and as you know, you can go on details here and inspect the artifacts. What you can do now is we have this little online tool, which we also use for OpenShift. And it's, you know, available for everybody. You just copy this Prower URL and you paste it into this tool called Prometheus. <laughs> it's a funky name. Um, and then it, you know, spins up a Prometheus for you so you, you don't have to do all the things that I just showed you on command line. Um, you just invoke this link and in boom, you have the same um, sort of like metrics result. And the nice thing of this here is that it also sort of like um, narrows down and filters the end-to-end -end, um, starting times for you. So you don't, don't have to sort of like pick them up and then you can directly, um, you know, in, inject your metrics that you're interested here. Um, for instance, I just, you know, th this is some, like a metric that um, gives us a like rough overview of the request duration of API server requests. And we see like we have maximum of three and a half seconds on the resource, the forces, which I believe is a resource that was being spinned up, um, you know, during end-to-end -end tests, I guess. Um, so that's pretty much to it. Any questions, Mike? Uh, Mike's got one. Yeah, um, I, I was wondering about metrics uh, months ago and um, asked a basic stupid question that just got deferred, I think. Um, are, are the, I know Kube API server has metrics, and obviously they're not, logical cluster aware. Um, so are do we now have a KCP cluster aware metrics? Or are they cluster oblivious or what? 
they are not cluster aware and they shouldn't be the same way how namespace aware metrics are not a thing in queue upstream as well and the problem here is um, um you know that you know workspaces are do not have an apple bound like they can and lit we literally want um millions to be there and there is a problem uh, which is called the cardinality problem so if we would allow tracking metrics per workspace we would have literally an unbounded amount of metrics and we could very easily overwhelm Prometheus. Um, multiply that by namespaces and then we even have a bigger problem. So unfortunately, you know, metrics only have a certain level of granularity and we have to be a little bit careful. Um, generally, when you inspect metrics in KCP, um, since it's an API server, so it's literally the same metrics as Cube API server has them unless we introduced new ones. Um, but whenever you create new metrics, just always be aware that any label that you set, uh, the rule of thumb is there should be a constant upper bound of label values that you set for any given Prometheus label. Otherwise, we could run into problems. Well, so sure. long yeah. story short, unfortunately, no. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, I'm aware of the cardinality problem, right? It, it just runs into conflicts with the basic idea that you're virtualizing the API server. Uh, so for other purposes, it would have been nice, but yeah, I, I understand the conflict. I got my answer how it's resolved. Thank you. Right. Stefan. Stefan? Yeah, just an addition. I think we talked about that. We could have a metrics endpoint per workspace, right? This is not expensive. Um, but uh, it's a problem, I think, in the metrics uh, infrastructure and cube. So uh, getting the workspace through there is hard or something. So collecting separate metrics counters and uh, other things, that's tricky, right? It's more like a programming question in cube right actually that was part of the complexity in my question right because you know the in the url structure right the you've got a url prefix that looks like a kube api server but in a kube api server you could add metrics to that prefix and yeah. you know get a metrics right which yeah. you can't now but coming back to your original suggestion stefan like even if we would do that like you would have to create scraping targets per workspace so like even in this world you would just have a very we wouldn't view. Right. We wouldn't watch them or scrape them. That's the point. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You wouldn't. Yes. So the yes. memory problem goes away or it's yes. dedicated. Yes, precisely. Uh, Lionel? Go ahead, Lionel. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're muted. I'm oh, still muted. <laughs> yeah, Lionel, you're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I'm looking at the current resource quota, and there's like 10 uh, instances, I think, of prompt players. Mm -hmm. And so I tried it, and I needed to delete manually uh, my instance. Well, mm -hmm. how does that work? Sorry? So how, how does that work? Do we need to delete our instance of so yeah, so you can you can just delete it and, and you're fine. Or last resort is what I just showed you with the GitHub actions. Or let me show you actually like this. The resource code is, is per user or it's global? It's it's global. It's global. So it's it's a scarce um, it's a scarce resource. So what I just showed you with the trick with um, with GitHub actions, you can do the same trick with pro metrics. So if you go into artifacts, you to shard it, for instance, in this case, and then into artifacts again, there is a new subdirectory called metrics. And then you can download the Prometheus tar. So if Prometheus is sort of like occupied with quota, you can just download the tar and just execute Prometheus locally, and then you're not affected by it. It's a, like, it takes a little longer, but still works. Right. Well, but I like the tool, like Prometheus, it's easy. So. So basically, uh, uh, so all can manage the quotas. Sounds like it. Um, I added, but have not yet documented, a make target for downloading the logs from the Prowl runs to your laptop or desktop so that you don't have to click through the browser to get them. Maybe we could do something similar to download the Prometheus tar file and spin up Prometheus locally, just as you know, an idea that might be helpful. Uh, Vishnu, you've got a comment? Yeah. So yeah, to follow up on the uh, video test, so are there, I mean, uh, actually I'm looking to 
do some performance test on KCP. So are there any suggestions on the areas which I can test? I mean, for now, uh, what I'm doing is uh, I'm exposing the slash matrix endpoint and uh, scraping on top of it. And as well as I'm scraping some of the sinker logs to see if I can get some latencies. So are there any other suggestions or areas which I can look into as of now at this point? I mean, the short answer is all of them. <laughs> um, I would say scaling scaling workspaces horizontally, so adding more workspaces and you know how do things change if there's ten versus a hundred versus five hundred um, you know adding more namespaces, like just adding more of everything and scaling out horizontally to see where things start to get slower. Uh, Sergius. So when we do those actions, uh, the only way to uh, uh, the only way to monitor the performance metrics is the slash metrics endpoint, right? Yes. Okay. I mean, you, you okay. could also, I mean, you could run SAR on um, you know a Linux system and try and capture some of the some of that information, but I think. Uh, probably going through the Prometheus metrics would make the most sense. Uh, Sergius and then Steve. Uh, yeah, Vishnu, I just posted on the chat, or maybe we can post it also on the issue itself. There is this project called Kubernetes Mixin. Mm -hmm. And this project, I, uh, I'm not saying you can use everything from that, but there is a lot of to scavenge from uh, when it comes to alerts for API server. So they mm -hmm. are like, dashboards for the API server declared in this project and a lot of recording rules and a lot of alerts, sort of like best practices around monitoring Kube API server. So I would imply that many of those best practices when it comes to SLOs and alerts that apply to stock Kube API server yeah. also apply to KCP. So it would be a very nice exercise to sort of like scavenge this repository look what alerts are available in there and what alerts and recording rules essentially are sort of like, um, you know, useful for KCP as well. Yeah. And then use those to evaluate like general performance of, of, of KCP. And again, I, I, I totally agree with Mike that it doesn't give us per workspace views, but it like even for a global view, like we need better insights on how we behave during a runtime. So just as a hint, uh, that might be a good source of inspiration uh, what to look for. OK, OK, sure. I'll take a look. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, I was just going to say, if you're, um, as far as measuring performance, I think I also heard mention measuring like resource consumption and stuff. Obviously, uh, depending on how you set up your test, if you're doing containerized stuff locally, you're likely able to use cgroups or eBPF or whatever um, to monitor that. Or if you structure it as a series of cube pods, um, you know you can scrape the Prometheus metrics from the host cluster. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, and I'll just uh, echo what was written in chat. Um, if you find yourself scraping logs to get information, uh, feel free to try and convert what you're looking for into meaningful metrics. And uh, you will definitely love to see some PRs there if you've got the time. Uh, if you don't have the time and just have ideas, please feel free to file issues and we can see about getting around to them. Uh, just remember that, as was discussed before, we can't, uh, we can't really have per workspace metrics, but we can have uh, global ones. Um, okay. All right, yeah. so. Anything else on metrics before we go on? OK, uh, David. There's uh, just a heads up to say that um, finally, the pod logs and the upsyncing of pods automatically uh, for all the deployments that are being synced uh, landed into main. So it's still under the KCP um, syncer tunnel feature flag since uh, we are missing one lay still missing one layer of security um when you know forwarding the uh, pods and resources to the physical cluster so but if you enable the this feature flag on both the kcp side and the sinker you know side when you do a 
KCP uh, workload sync and create your, your sync target, uh, then you should get the logs, uh, be able to exec into pods, uh, yes, and even uh, you know log the deployment. Uh, so feedback, uh, welcome. Very cool. Thanks, David. Um, so that's the end of what's on the agenda. I did remember I wanted to show the docs uh, update here. So when you come into KCP, uh, when you go to docs.kcp.io slash KCP, you'll be redirected to our latest stable release, which is still 0 0.10. But there is a version selector where you can switch to main. And uh, as we uh, release new versions, they will show up in here. We are only going to do the major minor. So you'll just see 0 010. You won't see multiple 010s or 011s. And I know that there was a question in Slack, uh, I think, from Mike about why does it say main here, but it says 0 0.10 here. This is a banner or something that's injected where uh, it just takes the latest release from the repository and shows that information. So that's why you see that discrepancy. Um, one thing that I'm working on that I hope to have a PR very shortly is that um, what we had in our, our older docs site is that if you clicked on developers, for example, it would open up a page here that just had content and descriptions for each of the, uh, the child pages. And so I've been working on making that a reality so that when you click on developers, for example, you see just a summary page and anything that gets added as a real page in the file system will automatically show up in here. You don't have to manually edit this page, uh, which was pretty cool to develop. And uh, thanks to some very powerful Make Docs plugins, this was a whole lot easier than it could have been. So um that's what i have on docs and i think we're we only have a couple minutes left before we are officially over so i'm going to propose we skip the uh the triage work for today and we can pick it up again um another time so uh thanks everybody for joining today i think this was a great meeting lots of good discussion steve i'm looking forward to those issues that you're going to be filing and uh, have a great rest of your week, everybody. See you next time. Thank you. See you.